Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. And today I'd like to talk about humanoids. In fact, the title of today's episode is Arizona Humanoids, 10 True Cases. While sightings are undeniably interesting, I think the humanoid cases are far more interesting. It's from these types of cases that we learn what the ETs look like, where they come from, how they behave, and what their mission is on our planet. And I've got 10 cases I'd like to present to you today, which are all quite different. They start in the 1960s and move all the way up to the 2000s, so about 50 years worth of UFO encounters. These do involve not only face-to-face -face encounters with humanoids, but onboard experiences as well. Some are quite brief, others are more extensive. Some are very much benevolent, others did involve some trauma. This is the sort of pattern we do see in these cases. So they're different enough that I think it provides a broad spectrum of what it's like to have an encounter with humanoids. And again, these all come from the state of Arizona, all across the state actually. And I think they provide some very interesting insights into the nature of extraterrestrial contact. So let's just get started. And the first case I want to talk about today, I call an alien on the road. This is a really interesting case for a number of reasons. Uh, the main witness found it quite frightening. This took place late at night while driving. A lot of people see UFOs while driving along remote highways late at night, but seeing an actual ET on the road, that's not quite as common. So that's one of the reasons I really like this case. Late on the evening of June 9, 1960, a young woman was driving her Cadillac through Globe, Arizona on her way to California. This was a lonely stretch of desert highway. Her husband, Joe, slept beside her in the passenger seat, and her two children were both asleep in the back seat. This is about 15 miles east of Globe, Arizona. And as she pulled around the corner of the highway, the beam of her headlights caught a small figure about 100 yards ahead on the right side of the road. The figure at this point was facing to her left and it looked like it was about to cross the road in front of her, so she slowed down, and to her shock, the figure, which she said was about three feet tall, turned and faced her. And this is when she got a real shock. I'll just let the witness describe what she saw in her own words. As she says, The second I saw that thing, my heart came up in my mouth and my stomach did a flip-flop. It was small, broad-shouldered, with long arms, dark in color, and it had a head shaped somewhat like a flattened ball, almost like a pumpkin. In his head were two yellowish-orange glowing eyes. I recall that when it was in side view, there was a light beaming out beyond the face. I saw no nose or mouth or ears. The body was not as well defined as the head, and I got the impression of hair or fur. So a very strange humanoid indeed. And after staring at her for a few moments, this strange figure turned and ran off the road and into the brush. She never saw an actual UFO or object, but the witness slammed on the accelerator and sped away, screaming at her husband to wake up. So he did wake up, and she told him what she had seen, and he wanted to return and look for it. And she refused. As she says, I told him that if he wanted to go back, then he could go back by himself, but neither my children nor I were going back there on that lonely, dark road. I don't blame the witness in this case for not wanting <laughs> to drive down that road again. Uh, seeing something like that can be quite a shock. Unfortunately, she is the only witness in this case. Her husband, again, did not see it. But it certainly is an interesting case and not your typical gray, as we often hear about. And the next case I'd like to talk about, I call a group of musicians abducted. In some ways, this case is controversial, as we shall see. But what's interesting about this case 
is it does involve multiple witnesses missing time, although the main witness who's reporting this case does remember quite a bit of it and it left him with profound after effects for years after the incident and that alone I think makes it significant. This case occurred around 1968 outside of Phoenix and I'll just quote the witness here as the witness says, the main witness, although this happened many years ago I am just now able to talk about it. I struggled for years as to whether this was an actual event or just some sort of hallucination. At the time of this encounter, the man was a guitarist in a small band that was touring the country playing music. And they had just finished a gig in Phoenix and had dri driven out of the area and were hanging out in their Volkswagen van. It was around 3 a.m. and they were smoking marijuana among them when one of them noticed a bright light approaching them from the distance. And at this point they all assumed this was the police so they stashed their drugs and waited. And this is when they realized something very strange was going on. As the witness says, well it didn't take long before we realized it was not a cop car but something we could not explain. So while some people may say, well, the fact that they were smoking pot sort of debunks this case, I'm not so sure that that's true because multiple people were watching this and of what happened next. According to the main witness, everybody in the group began to panic as they realized they weren't hallucinating and it wasn't the police, and instead it was something they were not prepared for. And again, I will just quote the witness directly. As he says... I wasn't the only one that saw this thing. Some of us started giggling uncontrollably. I wet myself, and our sound guy fainted. The next thing I know, I am in a room laying on a table looking up at some very bright lights. Not cool. I was freaking out. Then things started to get weird. Two skinny pale dudes with big eyes. I can't talk about what all they did. I think I blocked it out to keep my sanity. However, I had a sour stomach for a couple of weeks afterward, difficulty urinating, kind of a cruel preview of how things are for me at age 60. I don't remember being returned to the van, but we all woke up in the van naked, which in itself was quite traumatic. Several hours had passed, but none of us could clearly recall what had happened. None of us ever talked about what happened that night. It was too weird and strange, even for the 60s. I know this all sounds crazy, but it really did happen. So in desperation, looking for help, the witness did report his experience to the National UFO Reporting Center. And as he writes, what can I do to get some help? I still have night terrors, flashbacks, and more from this incident. I found your site using Google. I have nowhere else to turn. Thank you for listening. I really feel for the witnesses in that case. You can tell it was quite traumatic for them. I do hope they're all right. I don't know what happened after this. There's no real follow-up on this case, but they did report it to one of the UFO reporting centers. And I think it's an interesting case. And the next case I'd like to talk about, I call Abduction in the White Tank Mountains. This is another case with some very unusual high strangeness elements to it. This occurred on June 28, 1980, and yeah, it's a really unusual case. What I like about it is the main witness talks about having been given some advice by the ETs and also having been charged with a mission by the ETs, which we do here in some cases. And, yeah, some high strangeness elements that I think make it worth looking into. Again, it was June 28, 1980, and two ladies named Lou and Carol, and Carol's daughter, Laura, and their two dogs, went driving through the White Tank Mountains, actually hoping to see some UFOs, which had been sighted recently in this area. 
So they drove along a long dirt road and parked where it dead ended at the foot of the White Tank Mountains. Now this case does come from researcher Bill Hamilton, a prominent and well-respected researcher. But by the time these ladies, Lou and Carol and their daughter, arrived, it was late at night, and it was shortly after they arrived that Lou noticed some strange lights not far from them near the mountains. And at this point, Carol suddenly felt a strange tiredness sweeping over her. And shortly after seeing these lights, all three ladies inexplicably lost consciousness. All three of them woke up at some undetermined time later when they heard a voice saying, Oh, there is a car. And it gets really strange here. Looking up, they saw what appeared to be a beige hearse of 1930s vintage driving by. They became frightened because they could hear no sound coming from this car, nor was it kicking up any dust. So perhaps this is a screen memory? Hard to say. But quite frightened, they tried to start the car, but the engine wouldn't work. They tried again, and this time it did work, and they sped away. A few hours later, when the sun came up, they wondered exactly what had happened, and they decided to return to the scene. They found nothing unusual, but did learn that the car horn no longer worked. And it was clear to them they had missing time, being that it was only a few hours till the sun had risen, and they had just gotten there when it was dark. So they knew that they had had missing time. And certain that something strange had happened, Carol decided to go under hypnotic regression. And it was while under hypnosis that Carol recalled falling asleep in the car, only to awaken moments later, because there were three small figures, dressed in diving suits and helmets, standing next to their car. Carol found herself exiting the car with her friends and following the figures over to a large silver dome-shaped object that was landed not far away. A fourth being stood on a rim that protruded from the circumference of this landed UFO, and he held a flash-like instrument which he pointed at Carol, beaming her with light. And only then was she taken into the craft, followed by the others. Carol says she counted five of the small helmeted figures inside what appeared to be a control room filled with weird buttons and screens and colored lights. She was immediately floated off to another room where a tall being with a veil before its face undressed her and put her on a table where he proceeded to examine her. Carol says she felt an electrical pulse shocking her and the man explained that he was just adjusting her energy centers. He then told her not to eat meat as it was dis disrupting her energy patterns. So apparently he was concerned about her health. Hard to say for sure, but that's what it looks like. And then he told her something very interesting. He said that she has not been fulfilling her mission to tell the people of Earth the truth about the coming of the aliens. That I found quite interesting. And that's about all she recalled. Carol next found herself being dressed and taken out of the craft and back to her vehicle. And as soon as they were put back in the car, the ETs vanished and all the witnesses lost their memory of the onboard experience. So that witness did go under hypnosis to recall her experience. As we see, I think some people have no memory whatsoever of their encounter. This is a good example of that, which is one of the reasons I felt it was important to include here, because that does happen. And she did go under hypnosis and recalled, I think, the most of what happened to her when she was taken on board. Hard to say for sure, but it is interesting to me that she was able to converse with the ETs and they gave her advice and asked her to basically reveal the ET presence on our planet. That is something I have heard before. And the next case I want to talk about I call UFO Encounter in Jake's Corner. This is a really interesting case for a number of reasons. I think most interesting to me is it involves several witnesses, a whole family, 
uh, an extended family, all saw this UFO, did involve face-to-face -face encounters with beings, uh, where several me members of the family did see these beings. It also shows some very interesting aspects in that the ETs inv involved showed a real strong interest in unusual aspects to the witnesses physiology. He had some unusual things about his body and this really caught the ET's interest. And this is a pattern we do see in other cases. And another thing I like about this case is the witness recalled this absolutely consciously without the aid of hypnosis. So that makes this case significant. It was late August of 1987 and Colin Morrison, this is a pseudonym, was standing in the front yard of his home in Jake's Corner, Arizona. And standing next to him were much of his family, his grandparents and son and a friend. And it was just around sunset when everyone's attention was drawn to a white light moving on the hillside across the street. Now Colin assumed at first that this was a dune buggy except for the fact that instead of two headlights there was just one and it was, he said, quote, extremely bright. The object continued around the hillside and then without warning it launched into the air. So clearly not a dune buggy. At this point it moved slowly and soundlessly towards the witnesses. Everyone was completely mystified and they watched the light which Colin likened to a floodlight, for about 20 minutes. And finally, Colin and his friend decided to drive to another location to see the light from a different angle. And as they drove down the street, Colin was surprised to see a small red light fly up from the ground and into the object. He then saw other lights moving around the main bright light. At this point, their attention was drawn to a second and closer object on the other side of the road. And I'll just quote Colin here because this is where this goes from a sighting to a full-blown encounter. As Colin says, and I quote, The object was very close to the road. It had an extremely bright white light shining out of an opening. We couldn't see the object's shape, but it was very big. We decided to drive up to it, and as we neared it, perhaps 40 to 50 feet away, the car engine died. Now at this moment, the opening on the craft started to close shut, and when it winked closed, the car engine suddenly started. Now frightened, Colin and his friend raced home, only to find that this first object was now directly over the house. His grandparents were watching it with, with binoculars and they could not identify it and unable to identify it, his grandmother went inside and actually called Luke Air Force Base who told them that they had not received any calls about UFOs. And this is where this strange encounter became truly bizarre. Colin could hardly believe what happened next. As he says, and again I quote, I realize this is strange, but it's true. Everyone seemed to act like, so what? There's a UFO over the house. My grandparents and son went inside to bed. My friend and I decided to go to sleep on the front lawn, as if that was perfectly normal. We just fell asleep on the ground. So what's interesting about this is they're behaving in ways they would never normally behave. And that's definitely a pattern we do see in these cases. But at some point, Colin woke up to see a bright blue light flooding the yard. He then discovered that he was unable to move, and what happened next was even more bizarre. As Colin says, Small people approached us and said they were going to check our feet and that they would not approach my grandparents. They did some physical exams. My friend was completely unconscious, but I was awake and speaking to them in some manner. The people did not move their mouths when they spoke. So this is telepathy. And Colin continues his story as he says, At one point they told me a being was there. I understood it to be some type of scientist. This creature or thing was like nothing I can describe. 
It somewhat resembled a giant praying mantis. It was fish-like or bug-like and was absolutely the most horrible thing I've ever seen. I became terrified and was fighting them. It was my impression that this creature did not have any compassion for humans. It did not speak to me, but had a very cold presence. The next thing I know, my friend and I woke up in the morning still lying on the front lawn. So Colin was freaking out at this point. He asked everyone what happened. And while everyone remembered seeing the UFO, they were still acting strangely blasé about it. As Colin says, I was the only one that seemed to think something incredible had occurred. This is a normal after effect of UFO encounters. Often people won't talk about it or they're acting like it's nothing special. <laughs> Very strange. At any rate, Colin told his friend about the strange little people and that they seemed interested in their feet. And at this point, Colin's friend revealed that he did, in fact, have something very unusual about his feet. He had webbed toes. Uh, this is something that Colin did not know. He was surprised because he wasn't aware that his friend had webbed toes. But then Colin revealed that he also had an unusual anatomical anomaly. His toes were double-jointed. So later, Colin told his son about this whole incident, and his son said, well, the beings actually also spoke to him. And as Colin says, I've often wondered about what happened that night, and although it sounds incredible, what I've related is true. After the event, I had an interest in science, and I have since earned a master's in astronomy. As long as I live, I will never forget the sight of that object driving up the side of the hill and going into the air. As you can see, this did affect them profoundly. Uh, it was quite scary for them, uh, but they do appear to be okay. And again, it shows how the ETs do show a strong interest in humans and human physiology. Uh, it's just fascinating to me that they found the witnesses' toes <laughs> his webbed toes of extreme interest to them. And now we move to the next case. And of all the cases I'm presenting here, I think this one is my favorite. I call this the Ruby Alien. And this case comes from a fairly well-established researcher. He's written a number of books. And it involves an actual photograph of an ET. And that is really unusual. So, this case does have something important to say, I think, about this whole phenomenon. It was early one morning in August of 1988 that journalist and artist Ron Quinn received a call from his friend Sam, who he had known for nearly 20 years. Now, Sam is a pseudonym. He does not want to go public with his story. But following the death of his wife, Sam had been traveling throughout southern Arizona taking pictures of ghost towns, graveyards, and abandoned mines. So the two men met, and Sam told Ron that he had, quote, an odd and frightening experience. And he handed Ron Quinn an envelope and told Ron that there was a photograph inside of what he saw. And Sam said, prepare yourself for a big shock. So Ron Quinn opened the envelope, and his friend was right. Ron was shocked. As Ron says, it was a photo of what appeared to be a space alien taken from about seven feet away. So Ron stared at this photo. He knew Sam and that he was an honest and quiet man. There was no possibility that this was a hoax, Ron believes. So Ron asked him to explain the photo. And Sam said that on August 14, 1988, he was driving to an abandoned mining town outside of Ruby. This is just north of the Mexican border. And while taking pictures during the day, he heard a strange swishing sound, followed by a sonic boom. Looking up, he saw nothing unusual, so he continued to take photographs. It was about 20 minutes later, while hiking around this area, that he saw the entity and took a picture of it. As Ron says in his own words, standing a short distance off to his right 
was a rather small individual. It stood on the edge of the wash about two, three to two feet above him. At first he thought it was a child, until the figure turned and looked directly at him. Seeing what it was, Sam brought up his camera and quickly snapped off one picture. Before he had time to take another, the figure turned and ran quickly up the brush-covered hill directly to its rear. So this figure was about three feet tall, he estimates, uh, and Sam chased up the hill after this strange figure, but saw no trace of it, and when he finally reached the top of the rise, he heard the strange swishing sound again, but nothing was visible in the sky. He returned to the area where he had seen this figure and searched for footprints, but only found a few scuff marks. He went back to his truck, walking on legs that he said felt like wet noodles, and then he developed the photograph at the local drugstore, and it was then that he called Ron Quinn to tell him what happened. So Ron studied this photograph for more than an hour and became absolutely convinced that it depicts a genuine extraterrestrial. As Ron says, and I quote, its eyes were extremely large and full of life, not glass eyes set in some, into some Halloween mask. Its skin was light gray, and its eyes were quite large and bulged out slightly. Some thin character lines were visible on its forehead and around the corner of the eyes. The area above the eye, where the eyelid is, resembled the surface of an accordion. There was a slight shadow in the cheekbone area, and the mouth was quite thin and small. Its head was rather large for its body, and was minus hair. The ear was situated much lower than ours, and was no more than a fleshly lump with an opening. The nose was almost non-existent, but had small nostrils. Its chin was long and broad. So, this is not your average gray. But again, it was about three, maybe four feet tall. Ron said that the figure had four long, slender fingers on its hand, and the expression on its face was pleasant and non-threatening. Also interesting was its tight-fitting garment, like a jumpsuit. As Ron says, its texture looked as though it had thousands of minute wrinkles throughout the surface, and no buttons, clamps, or zippers could be seen. Ron was deeply impressed by this photo and asked Sam if he could borrow it and make copies, but Sam refused. He said, I'm afraid I've taken a picture of something I shouldn't have, and he asked Ron's advice about what to do. And Ron advised wisely, I think, against contacting any authorities, but suggested that a UFO research organization might be helpful. But Sam was afraid of any publicity or attention, he wanted nothing from this and said only that he would think about it, but he did give permission to Ron to talk about the case as long as Sam remained anonymous. This did take some convincing, however. Ron himself did contact UFO investigators. He contacted Jerome Clark from Fate Magazine, who seemed interested in the case. Act and later, Sam told his brother about the photo, and Sam's brother also urged Sam to go public. Uh, he was also convinced that this was a real photograph and that they could perhaps sell it and make some money. But this was not something Sam was interested in, and so far, Sam has declined to go public, and as far as I know, this photograph has not been released. But as Ron Quinn writes, I'd like to know how the general public and the government will react to seeing this remarkable picture. I saw it, and the alien is real. I'm really sorry we didn't get the actual photograph in this case, but the drawing does provide, I think, a pretty interesting glimpse into what this photograph looked like. Maybe someday Sam will come forward with the photograph. I sure hope so. It sure would be something interesting to see. And now let's move to the next case, which I call A Ride Aboard a Flying Saucer. I love this case because it is absolutely benevolent. This was not an abduction, as many people call them. 
This witness feels like it was absolutely benevolent and he was invited aboard a flying saucer for an actual ride. So it's a really remarkable case. There's not a whole lot of details to it, but I thought it was important to include here because I do know of other cases very much like this one. This case was uncovered by Arizona-based research Tom Dongo, who's written a number of really well-received books on UFOs and other paranormal incidents. And this incident took place near Cave Creek in Sedona in the late 1980s. The main witness is Gary, that's a pseudonym, who was quite elderly and in extremely poor health. And one day he was driving through the Arizona desert when his car engine sputtered and died, forcing him to quickly park alongside the road. He exited the car and opened the hood to examine the engine when suddenly a, quote, blonde man walked out of the desert towards him. The man spoke, saying that he was not from Earth and would return in four months to take Gary up into his ship. And despite this strange statement, Gary felt this man was very much sincere and he was impressed that this man was so kind and gentle and wise. This man then turned and walked back out into the desert where there was nothing out there. <laughs> Gary then tried to start the car and it functioned normally. And four months later, as promised, this man showed up and gave Gary this ride aboard a flying saucer. Gary told only a few people in his family about this story and then passed away shortly later. And researcher Tom Dongo did not talk to the main witness, Gary, but actually obtained this story from Gary's daughter. Yeah, I love that case. I tell you, if I ever got an invitation to take a ride aboard a flying saucer like this, I would go. I mean, I think that would be a really cool experience. I'm just sorry we didn't get more details about it. But there are many more cases, and the next case I'd like to talk about today, I call contact in southern Arizona. And this is an amazing case. Uh, the main witness I call Sherry. I uh, don't believe that's her real name, or if it is, it's just her first name. At any rate, this is a very interesting case because it does involve actual photographic evidence of the craft, and not only that, other actual physical evidence, including medicine given to the main witness by the ETs. It also comes from a, a pretty prominent investigator. So I think it's an important case for those and other reasons, as we shall see when we get into this case. Sherry claims to have had ET contact periodically throughout her life. However, on February 20th, 1991, she experienced a particularly dramatic encounter. It was around 2 a.m. when she woke up in her southern Arizona home and felt this familiar urge to go outside, and not far away was a large cylinder-shaped object about 100 feet long and 20 feet thick. A steady blue light glowed from the rear while the front was illuminated by a pulsating pink light. The next thing Sherry knows, she's being taken on board this craft, it was on board where she met three different types of ETs, including humanoids, which she had previously encountered, greys, who were busy operating the ship itself, and a large reptilian type of humanoid that she had never seen before. And the reptilian, said Sherry, had scales instead of skin and bright gold eyes. The ship itself appeared to be larger on the inside than it appeared from the exterior, and the front section was the navigational area while the back part of the craft was filled with machinery of some kind. It was on board this craft that Sherry was given these strange round silver pills pictured here by the ETs, which she was told would, quote, rejuvenate her body. And she consumed the pills as instructed but she did save a few of them, and a sample of this medicine was later examined by UFO researcher Jem Cox. Jem Cox is actually the grandson of the pioneering UFO researcher Wendell Stevens. And Jem 
Cox investigated and examined these strange round silver pills, and as he says, and I quote, the medicine appeared to be metallic, about the size and shape of a BB. The spheres seemed to heat up when held in my hand. So Jam took a photograph of these and asked Sherry if she could get more of the medicine for a scientific analysis. S Sherry said she was actually given a strange mineral sample by the ETs who told her that it was an, quote, an alloy of metallic hydrogen. Uh, they told her it was used in the construction of the skin of their spacecraft. And the ETs actually showed her the formula they said that they used to produce this alloy. Sherry, after returning home from this incident, discovered that she had been gone for five full hours. This surprised her because she could only recall spending a short time aboard this craft. But there's further confirmation of this incident because sporting Sherry's case are photographs taken by her friend Dorothy which showed UFOs in the area where Sherry's contacts were taking place. As Jim Cox writes, Sherry's story is very interesting itself when reinforced with all of Dorothy's photos of UFOs in the area as well as the physical evidence, the medicine and the mineral sample. And her case becomes very exciting and worthy of some follow-up efforts. But fearing publicity, Sherry has insisted upon total anonymity, and as far as I know, there has been no analysis of the medicine or the mineral sample, at least not revealed to the public. Yeah, that is a really unusual case. I have heard of other cases involving this same sort of medicine, little round silver looking balls, but it's very unusual that people have an actual photograph of this. I do wish the medicine had been analyzed. That might have proved to be really interesting. But nevertheless, it's still, I think, an important case, which is why I wanted to include it here. And the next case I want to talk about, I call an onboard encounter in Dewey Humboldt. This occurred on September 28, 1991. And what's really interesting about this case is that this witness was able to re remember this consciously. It's a case that basically resulted in a spiritual transformation of the witness and it's also got a very unusual aspect because this witness was not only taken on board but taken to a place far away from Arizona apparently as we shall see. It was around midnight on September 28, 1991 when Leslie Ballard, this is a pseudonym, woke up from a sound sleep to hear something moving around in her home. She sat up in bed, looked through the open doorway and down the hallway, which was now lit up with a strange, almost opaque, blue-white light. And she immediately looked at her baby, who was only a few days old, and saw that she was sleeping soundly in the crib next to the bed. This is interesting to me because ETs do often show an interest in human reproduction and will show up when a woman is uh, nine months pregnant or just had their baby. And that's true in this case. So when Leslie looked back to the hallway, she saw a short, childlike figure that she described as fat and almost blobby and looking brown in color. Seconds later, she saw a small, gray humanoid figure at this point, Leslie jumped out of her bed to observe them more closely, and this is when she saw a third type of figure, a taller, thin, insectoid figure with blue-gray skin. It stepped through the wall and into the hallway facing her bedroom. And as Leslie says in her own words, this thing was thin and huge. It was acting dainty-like. It put its hands out towards me, and for some reason, I walked to it. I wasn't scared at all. Leslie had the impression that this figure was female. She described it as being six, maybe seven feet tall, and it moved with this incredible calm grace. It had large wraparound liquidy eyes with visible eyelashes on the bottom and a slit for a mouth. 
Leslie also noticed that the skin on its face was sort of pockmarked with either very large pores or blemishes. And she found herself grabbing the ET's hand, which she said had only four fingers. At this point, she turned around and looked back in the bedroom, and the little gray being turned and looked back at her. And Leslie, at this point, saw that her husband and baby were both still soundly asleep. She turned and looked back at the tall figure, and Leslie could hardly believe what happened next. As she says, we stepped through the wall and into their craft. Leslie described the interior of this craft as being creamy pearl white in color. She was fascinated by the walls, reached out and touched them because they looked almost translucent. And as she touched them, her hand and fingers appeared to glow. The craft was really beautiful, she said. The seats on the craft were molded into the wall. She could actually now at this point see outside the craft, which appeared to be moving at super high speeds. There was a strange, quote, bulb light thing in the center of the craft, and she could hear it humming loudly and causing the air around it to vibrate. And as Leslie says, I went to put my right hand on it and the short, fat brown being grabbed my wrist. His hand felt like sandpaper. So probably not a good idea to just go around touching strange instruments inside a craft. And she was stopped from doing so. And at this point, the gray motioned the short being to let go of Leslie's hand. And the tall blue-gray being then pointed outside and Leslie saw that it was now daylight and the craft was hovering in place. So it must have been halfway across the world because at the time of this incident, it was night. So the craft dipped down and Leslie was now surprised to see water. The three beings turned and looked at Leslie and then the gray turned to her and sent a telepathic message saying, we do exist where we can't be seen. A shorter figure then manipulated the weird instrument, the bulb-like instrument in the center of the craft, and suddenly the craft dropped and plunged into the water. Leslie continued to look outside at what appeared to be the deep ocean depths. Bubbles floated upwards and she saw spears of sunlight coming down, and as Leslie says, I saw a beautiful coral reef. You could see some fish swimming around, some plants. I remember a huge yellow fish with a blue stripe next to the wall of the craft. The next thing she knows, this craft is moving upward and out of the water. It began to move again at super high speeds, and suddenly it became dark again outside, and Leslie found herself being led out of the ship and back into the hallway of her home. It was now 15 minutes after midnight, and Leslie obediently crawled into bed and turned around just in time to watch the tall being disappear through the wall. Uh, this experience was not traumatic for her. In fact, Leslie found herself somewhat transformed by this experience. As she says, From that day on, I have had a new perspective about life elsewhere and where they may be hiding out. And at this point, she is considering regressive hypnosis to explore the incident further but as far as I know, has not done so yet. Yeah, again, what I like about this case is she recalled it without the use of hypnosis. And also what's interesting to me is that the witness remembers seeing the outside of this craft and being underwater and seeing a coral reef. Now, there are no coral reefs anywhere near Arizona. So I can only imagine where she was taken. I don't know, but it certainly is an interesting aspect to this case. And also interesting is that it really affected her profoundly. I think that's actually true for most cases, but this is something that the witness felt was really important to state. So yeah, a really interesting case that I think definitely deserves a place on this list. And now we move to the next case. And this case I call Touched by a Gray. This is an interesting case for a number of reasons. Uh, this involves multiple witnesses and face-to-face -face encounters. And as you shall see, some really interesting physical evidence. In February of 1997, 
Louise, that's a pseudonym, and her husband moved into the new mobile home in Chandler, Arizona. And it was one month later when she woke up one evening to find her room filled with light. And as Louise says, I saw three small, thin aliens, the exact kind we call greys. One was next to my husband's head, one was at the foot of the bed, and when I went to sit up in bed, I turned to my side and there was one right next to me. The gray took his long, skinny index finger and touched me light on the forehead, right between the eyes. So that in itself was kind of interesting. At this point, Louise had just enough time to notice that the alien had only three fingers and a thumb, and she fell unconscious. She woke up the next morning and instantly remembered what had happened. Adrenaline pulsed through her as she pulled herself out of bed, and she discovered that she was extremely thirsty, weak, and that her body was sore all over. She said she felt almost as if she had been drugged and was now coming out of surgery. She dragged herself to the kitchen, was drinking a glass of water, and at this point she saw her six-month-old kitten outside. And she gasped in shock because the kitten had been in her bedroom. It had never been outside before. It was far too young. All the doors were locked, so there was no possible way this kitten could be outside. She went outside to rescue her cat and got another shock because she saw that her hair scrunchie which she had worn to bed, was now lying on the outside porch. So this was absolute confirmation to her that her experience was not a dream and that ab was absolutely real. The next day, Louise called her mother and told her about the incident, and her mother had something interesting to say about it. She revealed that Louise's grandparents had once been followed by a UFO as they drove to Las Vegas. They said the object had actually struck them with a beam of light, and the next thing they knew, it was morning, and when they arrived at their destination, their family was frantic because the grandparents were six hours late. And in fact, the police were out searching for them, thinking that they had been in some type of accident. And it was later that the grandmother spontaneously recalled being inside a small room examined by four gray-type ETs. So this is significant because, as you know, if you research this field, these encounters do run in families, and that's exactly what happened here. I like that case, not only with multiple witnesses, but the fact that you know her cat was inside, and her hair scrunchie was outside, and all of these things point towards uh, confirmation that this actually did happen. It's a pretty interesting case, and a lot of ways I think it does fit the pattern we see in other cases but there's always these little tiny clues that point to the witness that something amazing happened I think sometimes perhaps you know, I'm speculating here but I think that perhaps the ETs are doing these sort of things on purpose uh, to give the witnesses a clue that they were there again that's pure speculation but it happens so often that I wonder about it could be an accident I don't know but I think you'll agree that that was an interesting case. And now I want to present the last case for today, and I call this one Something Not From This World. I like this case because the witness came forward publicly. It also occurred over a period of weeks and involving first one witness and then his brother. So they got interesting confirmation and corroboration that something very unusual was happening to them. It was February 2005 and Eric Dosh had worked all day long at the Snowball Ski Resort near Flagstaff in Arizona. And he returned home and was feeling tired and went to bed early. It was around 10.30 p.m. and a few hours later, around 1.30 p.m., he woke up suddenly because he sensed that someone had just entered his room. And as Eric says in his own words, All I really remember is a person with a rather large head and eyes looking down on me in bed. I tried to move but wasn't able to. There must have been some sort of force field holding me down. 
Eric struggled against the paralysis, moving first his hands and then with great effort moved his head up. Freaked out and somewhat angry, he flipped up his middle finger at the being and finally it went away. And as Eric says, I know it sounds funny, but this event scared me so bad I couldn't sleep in my bed for weeks, fearing that they would come back. Eric did tell his father what happened, but his father laughed and said it must have been, quote, just a dream. But here's where it gets very interesting. Uh, there was a very strange end note to this case, and I'll just let Eric describe it in his own words. As he says, Here's where the story turns twisted. Three to four weeks later, my younger brother Devin had the exact same thing happen to him in his room. I noticed he wasn't sleeping in his room for a while, so I asked him what was going on. He told me that he had an encounter with something not from this world in his room the night before. He then explained to me exactly in detail what happened to me a month or so prior to him. So they both had the same darn experience. Very interesting. What I like about that case is they did get confirmation, the two brothers. Uh, this is not that unusual, but I can only imagine how it must feel to be alone with your encounter and then later get confirmation from another member of your family, which is exactly what happened here. So a really interesting case, although there isn't a whole lot of information to it. It shows the pattern we see in so many of these cases. People all over the world are encountering humanoids. And all these cases are from Arizona alone. I did present these cases in my book, UFOs Over Arizona, a true history of UFO encounters in the Grand Canyon State. So if you'd like to explore more about them, you might want to check out that book. The cases I presented here are just the tip of the iceberg of what's going on in Arizona. Arizona is definitely a very active state. But yeah, I hope that you found this episode entertaining. I hope you learned a little bit about ETs and their mission on our planet. And I want to thank you very much for watching. I truly appreciate it. Until next time, keep asking questions, keep searching for the truth, and most important, keep having fun. Bye now.